So welcome to our webinar on building a foundation for success in court. Um, we are recording this webinar, just so you know, and we will be sending you all the link to the webinar recording so that if you have um, coworkers who are not able to participate or new staff who come on board, you'll be able to access this. Our goal for today's event is to help to strengthen teamwork between DSS attorneys and social workers. Um, I'll just mention one more time, we do have handouts we'll be referring to, so if you have not yet had a chance to do so, you can click on that link on the slide and it will open up the handouts in a PDF for you. Um, we have 320 people who registered for this morning's event, which um, is great. Uh, I think that reflects the importance of this topic and what interested of what interest it is to people. And this webinar was explicitly marketed to both DSS social workers and DSS attorneys. So we are really glad to have both of those groups on with us. Um, we had a, have a total of 68 county DSS agencies that um, registered at least one person um, for this event. And we have lots of people lots of counties who have multiple folks participating. So you'll see, if you just logged on, you'll see um, uh, folks have been using the chat box to let us know what county they're from and if there's more than one person with them, because we love to know it's so helpful since we can't see your faces. It's helpful to know just a little bit more about who is out there listening. Uh, let me tell you our agenda for this morning. Um, I'm going to do a very brief orientation to this webinar room, and I'm going to introduce our three guest uh, speakers. Then we are going to talk a little bit about testifying in court and um, the, the trauma that that can create, both for children and for social workers. We're they, then going to talk a little bit about role clarification of um, what is the role of different people um, at DSS and those who work for DSS um, in preparing for court and presenting the very best uh, case that we can uh, on behalf of the DSS agency. We're then going to talk about the top 10 things we need from each other. What, what are the sort of magical ingredients to a good working relationship between DSS social workers and DSS attorneys? We're then going to have lots of time for a number of case examples, some sort of very general but common situations that arise so that you have a chance to hear from our panelists and also um, from all of you to contribute um, to how to handle some pretty typical uh, difficult situations. And we'll also have time for some open um, question and answer with our panelists. So most of you have already found the chat pod. This is the main way that you'll be able to communicate with us today. So please continue to use it. Um, let us know your questions, your examples, your comments. I think it, like any training, it's so much more interesting when the participants are involved in the discussion. And it's, it's just a much better discussion when we have your expertise and your um, perspective. So please continue to use that. We really appreciate that. Oh, one other thing I want to mention on the chat box is um, we do have folks online to help with any technical problems. So feel free to also use um, the chat box if you have a hard time hearing me or with any other technical issue. Um, our technical folks will communicate with you privately. So if you look on the slide, you can see where there's a little box that says everyone, and next to it there's a little box that says hosts. If you have chatted a concern about a technical problem, you will get a little flashing box at the bottom of your chat box that will either be from Philip Armfield or John McMahon, and that will be them responding to your concern. So just click on that um, flashing box, and you'll be able to um, have a little exchange um, with our technical support folks. We do also have some little icons that we'll be using, and I just want to show you how to get to these. If you look up at the top of your screen, there is a picture of the little man raising his hands, and there is a little drop-down um, drop arrow. And if you use that drop-down arrow, you get a whole menu of icons. Um, so you feel free to use these as well. You'll see that these can give us information about um, the volume or the speed and also if you agree or disagree. So just to make sure you've all found that, would you go ahead and click the little green check mark 
just to let us know, or any other one. Thank you, John McMahon, for giving applause. Um, just click any of those icons just so we know you know where they are and you're ready to use them. Thank you, thank you. I see folks finding them. OK, excellent. Um, and then once you do that, you're able to select the bottom option to clear your own status, if you would like. So you can go down to the bottom option and clear your status. We will also be doing a few polling questions um, just as another way of getting your input. OK, so let me very briefly introduce our panelists. We are so excited to have them. Um, the first person I'll introduce is Alice Espenshade. And Alice has been the attorney for Beaufort County DSS since 1995. Prior to that, Alice worked as an attorney for the GAL program. And she has her law degree from Seattle University in Tacoma, Washington. Right? In Seattle, Washington. <laughs> That's why it's called Seattle. <laughs> Um, Holly McNeil, many of you know Holly, and you see her smiling face there. Holly is uh, the MRS consultant and trainer for the Division of Social Services. Before coming to the division, many of you knew, know Holly from the time when she worked at Catawba and Caldwell County GSS agencies. And Holly received her degree from Northern Illinois University. And we also have Angie Stevenson. And um, many of you know Angie as one of the Assistant Attorneys General for Child Welfare with the North Carolina Department of Justice. Angie also previously worked as a DSS social worker here in North Carolina and in Hawaii. And Angie has her MSW and uh, JD degrees from here at UNC. So I'm just going to pull up a quick polling question, because we want to have a sense of um, who is in the audience with us. And so if you would um, go ahead and take this poll and let us know what is your role in your agency. I'm just going to give people a few minutes so we can get a sense of who's in the audience with us. OK. Uh, yes, you know what I realized? Some of our polling, this is actually one where you can only choose one. So I, we should have set that differently, because um, I know there's lots of people in groups. But so we have lots of direct service, almost half direct service. A lot of supervisors, which we are thrilled to see. We have lots of supervisors register for this. We'll be talking a lot about um, um, the role of the supervisor in really building that relationship. Um, and great to see we also have several attorneys and um, leadership. And thank you. Some of you are already taking the initiative. If you um, want to use the chat box, if you have more than one role represented in your group, um, you can let us know from the chat box. Again, that can help us adapt our presentation to make sure we're meeting everybody's needs. OK. Thank you for doing that. And you can continue to let us know who's with you. Um, we'll be tracking all of that. And meanwhile, I'm going to turn the mic over to Angie to talk a little bit about testifying and trying. Thank you, Millicent. Um, and it's great to be here today. We talk, we've been talking a lot um, in North Carolina about trauma in general, especially um, talking about children in trauma uh, with the project broadcast initiative that's going on at the Division of Social Services. So this will probably not be unfamiliar to people. Maybe starting <clears throat> starting to think about trauma um, or think, think about child welfare in a trauma lens. Um, and you're probably hearing a lot about um, secondhand secondary trauma as well, um, which is something that can happen just from working with children who are in um, experiencing a lot of trauma. And that's not uncommon either for social workers. Uh, what we're going to talk today, though, about is uh, trauma that's firsthand, because going to court can be traumatic in itself. And we're going to talk about that kind of as a parallel process with what happens to children when they're traumatized. Um, going to court in its own self can create a traumatic response from you. And if you look in your handouts on page 19, there's a link there to a document that I'm going to be talking, I'm going to use kind of as a 
guide for um, discussing this, and you may want to read it in more depth. It's fairly lengthy, but it's really helpful, and it's an interesting way to view testifying. Um, as, you, as you know, testifying can re-traumatize children. It's a new and threatening environment. Um, there are intimidating people in questions. Uh, you can feel attacked and alone. It can trigger painful memories and sensation. And uh, to a large extent, this is, a, this is the big one, it can create a loss of control. Well, all of that is true for you, too, when you're in the courtroom. Um, and when you're thinking about testifying, probably all you're going to experience, if not all of these, at least some of these. Um, so, so a couple things that, that in particular you're going to be aware of is that you're going to have some sense of loss of control. Well, um, let's look in more depth at how that works. So you're going to have anxiety, particularly if this is your first time testifying. You might have some anxiety. That will actually create physical changes. And in that article that's by Perry and Welch from 2002, they m mentioned tightening muscles, your voice cracking, heart racing, and sweaty palms. That's not um, all inclusive. There can be other physical things that are going on. But you have that's just a natural response to something like testifying in court. Um, when you have the physical changes, that makes it less likely that you're able to remember things. And then that makes it more difficult to explain your opinion. Um, that can be combined with in attempts in court, which are just the natural way that court works, to confuse or intimidate you. Um, and when that happens, then there's a tendency for you to appear defensive and combative if you respond um, in a way that that it would otherwise be a natural response when someone's intimidating toward you. So it kind of creates a cycle then, because then as you appear defensive and combative, you're going to have more anxiety, and the cycle just continues. Um, and again, it's a remember. Think about this as a, just as a reminder, as a parallel process of what happens to children and teenagers when they're acting out. A lot of times, it can start from just anxiety. Um, and some of the symptoms of trauma. So let's look at what you can do about that. I think the first thing to remember is just to, or to think about is just that the stress response is normal, and that's expected when testifying. So it's not, there's not something wrong with you. This is what happens when you're human. Um, your body responds this way. Another thing is to understand your role and the role of others in your agency. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about that in a little bit. And, um, but I think that's important, because if you know what your role is, then you're going to do a better job of the third step here, which is preparing. And preparing is really important. Uh, one of the things that it does is it gives you a solid understanding of facts and dynamics that are going on in the courtroom. It helps you be more clear and precise when you're testifying, and it also helps you when you're prepared, you're going to feel more comfortable and you're going to feel more confident, which will make it harder for you to be pushed along that arousal continuum that we showed on the slide before. So some of the things that you can do when you're preparing is think about the things that you're able to control when you're testifying. One of them is how well you know the facts. So know the facts really well. Spend, block out time to test or to practice test to practice your I'm sorry block out time to research and look at review the record um, and be ready for when you testify uh, and that means not just your own notes and the work that you've done but if you're the third or fourth social worker in the case make sure you know what the other social workers have done ahead of time I mean you really give yourself permission to know that record well because when you know it well that's something that you're in control of and you're going to be able to answer questions very well and you're not going to be as easily um, confused or um, intimidated Another thing you can control is your demeanor. You can be um, make sure that your demeanor comes across as professional, um, that it shows respect for the proceedings, respect for the importance of the subject matter that you're dealing with. Uh, your demeanor goes a long way in working with your reputation. So make sure that you are um, 
that you've thought that through and that you do control what you can about your demeanor. Um, that includes, you know, we, we um, talked about that there's techniques for intimidating you and trying to confuse you, and that usually happens on cross-examination when the other side's attorney is, is examining you and asking you questions. Uh, there's few things that are more irritating than arrogance or sarcasm in a witness. So really be careful not to do either of those and not to be defensive. Um, and you can just consciously, if you have to slow yourself down, take a little more time, take a breath, just think about how you're coming across. Um, you can also control your appearance. Uh, your appearance should be, you know, more probably more conservatively dressed than usual and professional. If you look professional up there on the witness stand, you're going to feel a little more confident. You can control your knowledge base. This goes beyond just the, knowing the record, but know the know what's going on in the field so that you can understand the big picture. And then you can also, sometimes, usually, you're going to be able to control your familiarity with the courtroom. So if you have a chance to go into that courtroom ahead of time, do that. Um, watch what goes on. Learn the dynamics. Um, it, even when, when there's nobody else up there, maybe go sit on the witness stand ahead of time so that you kind of understand and can feel like you're, you won't be doing it for the first time on that day. Angie, can I ask you a question? One of the things in terms of preparation I've heard you talk about is how sometimes there are little idiosyncratic things that different judges might have. Do you want to say a word about that? Because I found that. Oh, absolutely. If your judge has a pet peeve, you want to know about it before you walk into that courtroom. So if you're new to your county, ask people that have testified a lot. Ask your attorney, what are this judge's pet peeves? If, if you have an opportunity, I remember when I was a social worker, uh, I was a pretty new social worker, and we actually had a brown bag lunch with one of our judges. Um, and I remember asking him, what are your pet peeves? Um, and I, looking back on it, that, I'm so glad I asked that question, because I never did the thing that he said. His, his, his pet peeve was actually um, social workers that re recommend placing a child in a home they've never been to. Um, so, I mean, it was something like that, but it could be chewing gum, it could be wearing a hat in the courtroom, it could be open-toed shoes, you just don't know. But it, really, it's good to know ahead of time what your judge's pet peeves are. Thank you. Okay, let me see. I'm, um, it looks like so far we've gotten just a few questions, sort of technical questions, so I'm going to pass it on to um, Holly to talk a little bit about role clarification. But if you have any questions that come up um, about uh, trauma and what you can do to prepare and minimize your own trauma of the courtroom, feel free to use your chat box because we'll, be, we'll have more time to come back to your questions later. Good morning, everybody. This is Holly. I'm so glad to be here and so glad to see so many of you on this morning. Um, I am going to talk just a little bit about the different roles in the court process. And the first one we'll just talk about a little bit is the social worker role. Um, let's see if we can bring that up there. There we go. OK. So um, just to remember that you are the client, and your attorney is there to give you legal counsel. So in order for them to give you the best legal counsel, it will be really important for you to give them good information about what has led you to the decision to bring this case to court, um, to really give them specific behavioral descriptions of what happened and what has led, uh, again, what has led you to this case decision. Um, it's going to be really important for you to know um, and understand the definitions of abuse, neglect, and dependency. Um, you need to know what you're alleging in your petition and be able to prove each element of, um, of the the items that you're alleging. For instance, if you're alleging abuse, part of abuse is that you have to prove that um, something was done by other than accidental means. So you may be able to say, well, I'm alleging abuse because this child has these horrible bruises. Well, you're also going to need to be able to say, did that? what is the proof that this was done by other than accidental means? So thinking through those kinds of, th those kinds of things and knowing um, what what um, testimony will provide that proof is going to be very important. Along with this goes knowing 
who's going to provide that proof. You are often the star witness um, for, the, for the agency's case, but you may need to call in other witnesses, and your attorney may not know who those are unless you tell them who are the people that know this information. So you want to have those conversations um, with your attorney and give them all that information. Then, of course, is the, the written reports for your hearings. You want to um, write your court reports. Again, this is another, thinking back to what Angie said, this is another reason to know what your judge is like. What do they want their reports to look like? Um, talk to your supervisors. Talk to other folks that have been to court and know what you, they want in, in your court reports. Some judges will want you to have a running narrative that gives them the entire case history. Other judges only want what's happened since the last hearing. These are the kinds of things that you need to know so that um, they're going to get out of it what you want them to get out of it. Again, your written report should be clear and concise and behavioral. I know you guys get tired of hear hearing us say that, but it's really important that these are not general or vague. They need to be specific and, and behavioral. You want to stay away from coming to your own conclusions or um, your own judgments and really just lay out what the facts are, what you observed, what you heard, and um, it's for the judge to come up with those um, conclusions. And then, of course, most importantly, will be your testimony, especially during adjudication and TPR. In review hearings, which are most of the hearings you're going to go to, you'll be able to hand up your written report, and you very seldom have to take the stand. But for adjudications and TPRs, you, you will likely be the star witness for those cases. So you're going to want to do all of those things that Angie talked about to prepare for your testimony, um, and be aware of the fact that it it is traumatic. Um, I think it's helpful to just know that you're not the only one. We hear that most in um, when we do the legal aspects training, how nice it is for folks to hear that they're not the first person that's been nervous about testifying, and that it doesn't go completely away with experience. It certainly gets better, but uh, getting up there on the stand is um, nervous no matter what, so you want to take the time to do that um, preparation, and that is actually part of your role. And then in thinking about the supervisor's role, um, so important. The supervisor's role is so important here. And one of the most important things that we want to talk about, mm, yes, thank you, John, just reminded me. <laughs> Let's do this polling question first. <laughs> Um, uh, what does what your agency supervisor do? And this kind of goes out to the, to the social workers on. What does your agency supervisor do to help you prepare new workers for court? What are some of the things you do? And this should be one you can choose more than one answer. Right. Choose as many as. Good. I'm so glad to see so many saying ensure time with attorneys. And observing other workers in court, good. Great, great. I, I, again, in, in thinking about this supervisors, you can really play an important role in um, the system in your agency of, around making sure that social workers do have time with attorneys. I know some counties have attorneys on staff and others have uh, contracted attorneys and that sometimes changes the dynamics, but it is so important for workers to have some time with their attorneys to talk over um, to, for the social workers to provide them with information, as well as the attorney um, letting the social worker know what to expect in this case, to talk about what they might expect from the opposing attorney, things like that, so that that time with the attorney can be very, very important. And when they're brand new workers, you're likely... You, it, going to be necessary for you to sit in there with them to help guide them so that you can know where they may need some more work in their preparation for court and things like that. Um, the other 
important role that supervisors play is um, helping helping social workers prepare reports, making sure that they have the necessary information in their reports, and helping them to prepare for their testimony, helping them think through how they'll answer. Again, I want to connect back to some of the things that Angie said, thinking about not coming off as um, arrogant or flip um, or sarcastic. Uh, oftentimes, when we're nervous, we don't mean to sound that way. Way. So it's helpful to think through what your answers are and how they might sound beforehand. And to be prepared, help your social workers be prepared for the questions that might push their buttons. Everybody's got those questions. So um, what are some of the questions that, um, it, that might push this social worker's buttons and how are they going to answer that if it comes up in a way that will be respectful and professional? Because after all, this won't be the only time they're on the stand. They're going to be um, gaining a reputation by how they, how they um, put themselves forth on the stand. So you want to help them through help them think through those answers so that they'll be ready when they come up. Um, I'd love it for supervisors if you take a couple minutes and um, type into chat some of the other things that you all do to um, support and prepare your staff. I know we haven't thought of all of them. Um, I'm seeing a few things coming up in the chat box. Uh, yes, absolutely help them understand the different purpose and different types of hearings so they can understand the overall goal. Absolutely. Um, happily, there's um, some good resources also in the material that your folks will get from our legal aspects training that will um, help them look at those different types of hearings. So um, feel free to use those. Um, have them observe the court process and spend time speaking with the DSS attorney. Absolutely. Reviewing court reports. Nice, Jessica. I encourage them to develop a timeline of events that led to the petition, um, especially for those cases uh, that have been around for a while. Maybe it's already been in in-home services for several months. Or if you're going to TPR, sometimes that can be a very long time. And a timeline of events can be really important. Holly, can I ask a question? So um, I see, I, I love the idea of sort of helping them understand, remind them of what's the purpose of each hearing and sort of have a sense of the bigger picture so it's not just a recitation of facts sort of randomly. Um, but there's also one, a proof, Lori Jones has a proof summary um, so they know what is needed and why. Is that something I'm looking at, Alice? What Can you say a little bit more about what? Um, yeah, we usually proofread the summaries that they're preparing for the court. Um, and I do that for several reasons, uh, to make certain that you know the narrative's coherent and the story that they're telling matches the recommendations that they're stating at the end, because sometimes that's not always the case. Um, and and I'm, I'm just looking for things about the clarity of what's being presented to the court. And also, we've designed formats to use for each type of hearing with prompts so that they're hitting all the marks. Very often, the only evidence that comes into the courtroom in a review hearing is that written report. So if it doesn't hit every determination the court's required to make, say, at a permanency planning hearing, we may not have an evidentiary basis for all the decisions the court's going to have to make. So that's why we use this, uh, this system of prompts. Um, so that they have something in each one of those areas, and we've got a complete report. Um, but basically, it's about clarity and, and making the story clear and making certain they're providing the information the court needs to come to the same conclusion that they have so that it all lines up and matches. And if the, if the supervisors do that first, it makes my job easier to do that again. But um, Great. Thank you. OK. Do. Sorry, Holly. Let me pass it back. Sure. And um, I, I love what Alice said. And I just want to point out, too, that there are also model court reports that can be used. They're not required, but they also will help you hit all of those points that Alice talked about. Because there is an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of things that l certain language and certain things that need to get into these court reports and court orders. Um, and some of that goes back to funding. And we all know how important that is. So um, making sure that your court reports 
cover everything that need to be covered. Um, if you haven't seen the model court reports, I encourage you to go on to the forms website and take a look at those. Again, you don't have to use them, but it's th they give you a, a great outline for what is really required for each hearing. A couple other things that I saw as folks were typing into chat that I wanted to pull out that I think are really important. Um, I love the idea of making sure that you talk about family strengths as well as the things that aren't going so well. Um, I, that does not weaken our case. I think some people are afraid that pointing out what's going well will weaken the case. It doesn't weaken your case. It gives a balanced view and um, lets folks know that you are not just trying to pile on to the family. So so it really is important to talk about those family strengths. I think it gives us a lot more credibility when we can talk about family strengths um, with the same kind of detail and specificity as we do um, as we do the things that they need. Um, also, talking about a cheat sheet, um, if there are certain things, what you don't want to have up there is a, such a huge sheaf of paper or stack of cards um, for notes when you're testifying that um, you like lose track and can't find things and are shuffling. So if you have a cheat sheet that has some of the most important things on it um, and, and is concise, and everybody's system is going to be a little bit different for that. That. So make sure it's one that works for you. And then I also love the one that somebody talked about having family trees um, in case Bree said that they developed family trees for potential placements um, in case they're asked by any of the attorneys. I think that's a nice idea. Great idea. OK. All right. Yeah. All right. OK. <laughs> can't find my mouse. Sorry, I'm at somebody else's desk. Okay, so I'm going to move us on to the attorney's role, and I'm going to talk briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alice. And um, so the attorney's role, um, pretty concisely, is to give counsel on what is needed for court. So it is the social worker and the supervisor's role to make a social work decision on when it's time to go to court. The attorney's role is to talk about what do we have here? Do we have what's necessary? We hear that you think it's time for us to go to court, but do we have the necessary evidence to prove um, either abuse, neglect, or dependency? The attorneys are the um, are the are experts on the law and on those definitions, so they can help you think through. Um, what other evidence you need to beef up, who you might need to talk to, an extra question you might need to ask. Um, they can provide all those kinds of things, as well as making sure that you understand the rules of the court and that um, you're meeting all of those necessary rules. Um, OK. Um, part of their job also, of course, is to pre prepare the social worker for court. And I'm going to turn it over to Alice in just a minute to let her talk to you about how she does that. But I wanted to point out page 18 in your handouts, if you have them, is a nice worksheet that you might use in your county that has a list of some of the things that you need to do. And we're going to ask you to interact with us for a minute. Um, we're just going to take pull a couple of these out. And I'm going to ask you to give me a green check if this is something the social worker does. So the first one is prepare the petition. Is it the social worker in your agency that prepares the petition? And if so, if you'll give us a green check, remember that's you drop down that little status up there, that little guy with his hand raised. OK. All right. Okay, I'm seeing several green checks. Okay. So again, important, especially if you've got folks coming from another county. Um, some counties have the social workers prepare the court reports in, or prepare the petitions, and in others, the attorney does it. So it'll be important that you make sure the worker understands what their part is. Um, the next one we want you to think about is, who is it that identifies witnesses? If you can go ahead and clear your statuses and um, think about who is it that identifies the witnesses that are going to need to be called. And again, if it's a social worker, if you'll give us a green check.
So this is an area that um, the, the attorney really can't do by themselves. They may, may be able to read your court report and pull out some of the witnesses, but they're really going to need the social worker to at the very least assist them in thinking about who needs to be called, who holds the information that needs to be brought out, especially again during the adjudication in the TPR um, where the rules of evidence apply and uh, they have to have that first person testimony. Thank you for participating in that. And if you'll clear your statuses, we're going to do one more. And that is number 11. Enter into agreements with parents. And just for consistency's sake, I'll ask you to do the same thing. If your social workers can enter into agreements, these are legal agreements with the parents, give us a green check. OK, I'm seeing less green checks this time. So again, um, this is one, and your agency, you want to talk about how this works in your agency and in your county, but it's going to be important for social workers to know if it's okay for them to make agreements or make promises to parents. They're likely not going to want to do that without at least counsel from the attorney. So helping to think through that um, is going to be important for the uh, social workers and the, and the supervisors to help the social workers understand that. Um, I'm going to turn it over for a minute here and let Alice talk a little bit about some of the things she does to help prepare her social workers in Beaufort County. And Alice, before you do that, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing a couple questions are coming in when you said, Holly, uh, if social workers are able to enter into agreements with parents, could you talk a little bit, Alice, about what type of agreements okay. you're talking about? Obviously, there's a lot of interaction that goes on between the social worker and the parent. Um, you do the case plans, the safety agreements, all of those kinds of things. Um, and chances are you may have had a case plan in place before you go to court that obviously wasn't working that well. And then um, you're going to come back after court and design an out-of-home family services agreement or something. Um, the, the key issue is if there's someone representing the parent, um, you at least need to tell the parent that before you sign this, uh, you, should, you, you can review it with your lawyer. Sometimes when lawyers come on a case, the first thing they'll say to me is from now on, anything your social worker wants my client to sign, I'd like to see it. And we'll say, OK, we'll get that going. Others don't want to be that hands-on. And like I say, there's, there's almost daily interactions with, with these people. So you, know, you, have to, you have to kind of play it by ear. One thing um, absolutely you want to be careful about is, is anything that really has a profound bearing on parental rights, such as a major change in visitation plan or a relinquishment of parental rights. Um, in those cases, I think you probably need to touch base with your attorney before you have that kind of meeting with these people. Um, because there's some case law out there about um, represented people signing relinquishments, et cetera. So that's kind of the, the first thing is, are they represented by counsel? And if they are, maybe I should run this by the attorney. It would be a good rule of thumb. But in your day-to-day interactions with these people on these small agreements you make to get things going forward, you may not necessarily have to involve the attorney in that. Thank you, Alice. I'm sorry. And then if you wanted to say a little bit about what you do to prepare social workers in Beaufort County. Well, we've talked a little about the, the review hearings. I, I saw someone had a question about, do we have to testify as well as hand up a report? You should always be prepared to testify. And if you are the author of the report, you should be in the courtroom. Because it may be something as simple as a clarifying question from the bench, or it may be that somebody wants to call you to the stand and question you about something that you put in your report. So it's, it's good to write those reports carefully and be ready to explain them more thoroughly and not be surprised if someone decides to call you to the stand. Um, I usually script questions for the social workers and try to prepare them for what I anticipate coming out in cross-examination. Um, I, I work in a fairly small county, um, and I have the luxury of that time. Some of you have different arrangements with your attorneys where that might not be feasible. Some of you may do that kind of work with a paralegal or something else. So, But that's what we try to do. And when you have a brand new social worker, we spend extra time with them to get over the kind of anxieties that Angie talked about. 
Thank okay. you, Alice. <coughs> Holly, I'll pass it back to you just to finish up. All righty. So everybody has their role. Each role is equally important. And we all know how important teamwork is. We talk about this in many areas of our work. Um, when we're thinking about court, uh, if we have worked well together, if we have prepared ourselves and talked to each other, and there's been good communication going on, uh, court, the court process is going to be less traumatic for children. Uh, there's also going to be less anxiety for social workers. Uh, Angie talked about controlling what you can control. And that talking about that preparation piece being one of the things that we really can control. So by um, working well as a team, communicating well, um, it's going to be less anxiety for the social workers when they have to take the stand. And it's also going to make the hearings run more efficiently. Um, they're going to be more effective. If we have the right people telling the right story, um, then we're going to get better findings and better orders for our kids, which is going to keep them safe. Safe. Really important. I think we sometimes get kind of caught up in um, the rules and the policies and things like that. And we have to remember that the worst case scenario when we don't do these things well is that a child goes back into an unsafe situation. And if we keep that front and center, then I think that's going to be helpful. Um, we also can see improvements in well-being if we get the right orders in, if we're talking to each other, um, as well as moving moving towards permanence quicker. And the last thing that is just as important is that it's going it, this is our reputation with the court and the community. Um, if they see us working well together, they're going to think better of us and we're going to have um, a better reputation and, and that's what we want. We want them to see us as um, people who work well together instead of, well, I had to tell that to three different people and they work in the same building, don't they talk to each other? So um, just uh, trying to make sure that we're putting forth the reputation that we would like to have in the community. Great. Thank you. And um, Before we go into the top 10 things, let me just say we have a question. Should the social worker involve the parent GAL when negotiating important agreements with parents? Sounds like Okay. An attorney question. If the parent has a GAL, it's because the courts determined that they need some extraordinary assistance um, with the whole process and I think you probably should be involving them. Um, they may be useful to you in that they can help explain things. Um, the, the parent will per perceive them as a helping person where they may be perceiving you as hostile at given moments in the case, but it probably isn't a bad idea to include them. If you know they've been appointed, they've been appointed for a reason. Um, and it, it can't hurt to include them um, or at least invite them and, and invite the attorney to participate in whatever you're discussing uh, because that is a, an extra sensitive case when a parent has such vulnerabilities or limitations that the court has seen fit to appoint them a GAL. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I've been asked to speak on top ten things we need from each other. Um, we're just going to go through this quickly. A couple of questions that, to set the stage to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this. The first is, who does your attorney represent? Uh, the technical answer is the agency as an entity. And what that means is I'm looking out for the kind of the global interest of the agency. I'm not necessarily a particular social worker's attorney. There may be times when I am asking you in court to possibly admitting to making a mistake. Um, I'm doing that because of the second thing that's important here, which is what advantage does DSS have over every other kind of civil litigant? And the answer is we have an opportunity to accumulate credibility. We also have an opportunity to lose it if the court feels we are not telling them the entire story. So there may be times I'm asking you on the stand or in your report to include something, to admit an, an error or um, something, an oversight. And, and I'm doing that because of these two principles. The agency is the entity, and the agency accumulates credibility over time. So we're working towards that as, as a constant goal. 
it is a huge advantage that we have in court. I had a judge in court the other day was speaking to a group of attorneys, and he said, I know Ms. Espenshay will never lie to me. And that's because I've appeared before this judge and told him the whole truth with the help of all the social workers for years now. Uh, you can't buy that. You can't manufacture it. It is something that literally does accumulate over time with a fair and balanced presentation of facts to the court every time you appear before it. So we want to keep those two things in mind. Uh, mutual respect is the number one. Uh, you have to understand that we are different animals. I am not a social worker, and that is a good thing. You don't need a social worker for a lawyer. You need a lawyer for a lawyer. Um, and we do think differently. Uh, we have a different approach to life. The hierarchy of the law sometimes creates the impression that lawyers disrespect the policy that you folks are required to live by. And I'm sorry for that. But lawyers tend to think in accordance with the hierarchy of the law. Federal constitution, federal statute, state constitution, state statute, rules, regulations, et cetera, policy is at the bottom of that list. Um, and sometimes your lawyers will say things like, well, yeah, but that's not what the statute says. This is, again, something that we've been trained to focus on differently than yourselves. But bottom line, we do understand that policy drives every aspect of your work. And um, we have to honor that. It's something that's important to you. It should be important to us. Um, and when it comes to protecting children, no one's job's easy, and failure is not an option. So let's respect one another and the different strengths we bring to the job, and let's work together to get this going forward. Access. Um, access varies a lot. Uh, <coughs> and that depends on whatever contractual relationship your county has chosen to have with its attorney. I'm a staff attorney. My door is open. I'm in the building. So I give my people a fair amount of access. A contract attorney is someone who's out there maintaining his own office and all the overhead that goes with it. And he may not have as much time to spend face to face with you. So you've got to find other ways to get him the information that he needs. This may be required. You may be required to do this through writings. Um, and he may also resort to using paralegals. I know some of the larger counties have paralegals on staff. And these people have been assigned specific tasks. Most of them have to do with the collecting, sifting, and ordering of evidence. So you may be talking a lot to a paralegal and not so much to the lawyer. That doesn't mean the lawyer is not benefiting from the information that you're giving to them. Three, communication. I once had a program manager tell me that social workers didn't like coming into my office because I scared them. And I said, OK, what, what do you mean I'm scaring them? And, and then she said, well, the minute they walk in, you just so focused on them. And, and, and you're asking all these questions. Well, that is something that I paid $60,000 and spent three years of my life learning to be. That's the way a lawyer operates. We focus. Not all facts are legally salient. I'm trying to get to the ones that I need to make the decision. Please don't take offense at this. I, it's almost impossible for me to turn this off, OK? <laughs> so don't be afraid. Know that there are certain things I'm going to zero in on and want to know more about. And that doesn't mean that I don't value all the work you've done and all the things you've learned. But give me the information that I'm asking for, and the conversation will flow a whole lot better. One thing I, I beg everyone to do is to relate the events and conditions in the order in which they occurred, and not in the order in which you discovered them. OK? Um, <coughs> investigators tend to think of the case as a series of discoveries. And I understand that. But starting with me, or better yet, starting with your supervisor when you staff the case, you should be telling a story in the order in which it occurred. Unless you are an epic poet, don't start the story in the middle. Because everybody needs to hear the story in the order in which it, concerned. it occurred. <coughs> and the other thing about communication is use the mode of communication with your attorney that is most likely to bring your issue to her attention within the shortest time. I check my email at least four times a day. 
The people in my office know this. So if they want to get something to me, the email is the best way. They have a system as part of our new database where they assign tasks to people. And they were assigning tasks to me. I never looked in my task folder. So I wasn't seeing these things. So we had to have a little meeting and say, look, best way to get to me, send me an email. I'm checking at least four times a day. Your attorney may have a different way of dealing with things. They may direct you to call my number one assistant or paralegal and tell her, and she'll get it to me. So that's, you know, that's the thing that's important to know, the best way to get that information in front of the attorney. One of the things I would hope that the supervisors are doing is tolerate, not tolerating sloppy storytelling at any point in the proceeding. When you get to court, you've got to be ready to tell the story of that case in remarkable clarity with just enough detail and focused on the important things. Start doing this and demanding this from your workers in all the communications that they do, in their dictation, in meetings and staffings, and in these court reports. Don't let them come into your office and kind of wander around and tell a story for half an hour before they get to the point. Help them learn how to present information on a daily basis. That way it'll be a whole lot easier when they're writing a court report or they're having to testify in court. Preparation. Um, before you speak to the attorney or to the paralegal, if you're going to go through the paralegal, think through everything and be ready to recite the events chronologically. If there is conflicting evidence on an issue, you should have made up your mind what you believe happened before you talk to the attorney. You can tell them there's conflicting evidence, but that bottom line decision, that's part of what an investigator does. So have that clear in your own mind before you sit down and talk with the attorney. Okay, now there are questions that I ask every time someone comes into my office and says we need to file a petition. And a lot of newbie social workers are confused by these questions because they're not quite sure why I need to know all of this. Why can't I just file a petition and go? Where and when was the child born? Who is the father and how is his paternity established? Does the child have any degree of Indian blood in a federally or state recognized tribe? Where has this child lived and with whom over the last five years? Has anyone gone to court in this or any other state in an action related to the custody of this child? Does anyone other than a parent claim to hold custody or guardianship of the child? OK? These are things I need to know. Some of them have a jurisdictional element to them. I've got to be ready to share this information with the court. So I'm going to need it. Um, and we. We have something in place now where um, our workers carry these little tablets out into the field. They have all their standard forms in them. They can take their dictation and type it right in out there. One of the things they have is what we call the first interview checklist. And that checklist contains all the questions I just went through because they need to start asking at the very first interview with custodial parent in the case. They may not get all the answers in the first interview, but they need to start asking, OK? Um, number five is the early identification of problems. We are all human. The court knows this. The law has built into it several means to promptly correct small errors, typos, wrong dates, wrong facts, little things that don't affect the outcome but you want to get them perfect. There's all kinds of means within the law to change it, even after it's been put into an order, if they are relatively small things and we catch them early. Um, in general, you may not recognize the legal magnitude of a practical problem until you talk to the agency attorney about it. Um, you know, I had a, a social worker come to me once and say, do you have a standard form? for the director to sign to consent to surgery. Well, that sounded like a pretty straightforward question. I said, no, we don't have a standard form. What kind of surgery are you talking about? Social worker said, well, the 12-year-old boy who's in foster care wants to be circumcised. And it's like, OK. And I said, uh, why was he not circumcised as an infant? Well, 
the family belonged to a church that didn't believe in that. And so it's like there were a lot of issues there that she hadn't thought through or recognized as potentially legal or constitutional <laughs> issues. Um, so you know, sometimes, even if it seems like a small thing, it may be bigger than you think. So it doesn't hurt to, to run it past the attorney or start with your supervisor. If your supervisor doesn't know, you know, bring it to the attorney and see what the problems might be uh, from the point of view with the, uh, <coughs> the agency counsel. I'm sorry, I'm clicking ahead too fast. I don't want to make you all dizzy. But the game plan. Um, we need a game plan. And we need a game plan on several levels. We have a meeting at our agency with all the child welfare supervisors and the attorney twice a month to set the priority of cases requiring a new legal action, either the juvenile petitions or the TPRs. The reason I beg them to do this is because I had three people coming to me saying, we really need to go with the so-and-so case now. Everybody's problem was the most urgent. If I have all the supervisors in the room, we can discuss which ones really need to go first. Everyone knows that I will get to their case and when I will get to their case. Any deadlines like the 4E deadline that's approaching will be factored in. We look at all of the issues and they decide together this is what she's going to file first, second, third, and fourth. That makes everybody function a whole lot better. It keeps everybody sane. And I don't have people coming into my office one by one trying to pitch to me why their case is more urgent than everybody else's. So I think some type of priority, some kind of list that everybody knows we're going to do this case first and then this one. Obviously, cases explode. And when they do, the list changes. Um, the game plan, the short-term outcome, the short-term game plan is what are we going to get out of this review hearing, OK? <laughs> And if you're like wanting to change the case plan, uh, cease reunification, et cetera, there are notice requirements for that. There are things we have to cover in the court report. So I need to know if that's the case where we're trying to cease reunification in this particular hearing, I want to know about it. The long-term game plan is involving other things. What's the final outcome that's desired for a particular juvenile? the accumulation of credibility issue we talked about before. Sometimes agencies or the state will set specific goals for achieving permanence and safety within time frames. If you're a county like mine that is plagued with multiple continuances, that's part of the long-term game plan is trying to reduce those and getting to permanence faster. One thing that there should be a conversation between social work staff and supervisors and the attorney is the philosophy and practice of discovery. Um, this varies widely across the state. I know from talking to other DSS attorneys, some places are very, very strict about releasing information. Others are fairly wide open about it. Once a case starts, they get an order signed or they have local rules and information is freely shared. But it's vitally important whatever is in place in your county is something both the attorney and the social work staff need to understand thoroughly. So that is part of our, our joint game plan. Full disclosure, um, no good comes from keeping your attorney in the dark. And we have already heard from Holly and some of the others that it's important to disclose the good and the bad to the court, um, because our trier of fact is going to sign appropriate weight to these things. Um, you know, we have these permanency planning hearings. There's a lot of history in the case. Maybe early on, mom went to some parenting classes and started some therapy, and then things came off the rails. Give her credit for what she did, and acknowledge what remains in the case plan that is undone and link what is undone to the remaining risks of the child. That's the better way to do it than to just go into court and say all the bad things about her. Because that doesn't play well on cross-examination. You're going to get ripped apart as the uh, opposing attorney brings up every good thing they've done that you failed to mention. Context. Um, I had a program manager who would breathlessly announce that 
the start of any staffing. We have history with this family. And I'd say, OK, what kind of history? <laughs> you know, Good, bad, indifferent. Have we had a lot of reports, but not many substantiations? You know, what's going on with this particular family? Um, the age of the case, as you all know, determines the information the court requires. So we have to adjust the presentation of information to where we are in the life of the case. Um, you may need to understand the context of decisions that are handed down by our appellate court. And your attorney ought to be offering you a clear understanding of this. Sometimes folks on the social work side will get wind that some case came down and it's created a new rule or a new problem for everybody. These cases tend to be very fact specific. So you need to understand everything that was going on in a particular case if you are troubled by what you have heard the ruling to be. And that is something you should seek from your agency attorney. Um, interpretation. Uh, I interpret the law. You interpret the policy, basically. Um, to interpret the law, you can't just read the statute. You have to know about any appellate opinion that's interpreted the statute. You have to know how the statute interacts with state or federal constitutional principles. So these are things that the attorney is equipped to do. On the other hand, I'm ready to acknowledge that there are a lot of people in the building where I work who know more about a particular corner of policy than I ever will. Um, you know, and I have this little list in my head. Medicaid for children, I go to Marie. Uh, foster, I mean, food stamps, I go to Amy. I know these people. I, they are my go-to people because they live this stuff. They live and breathe it, and they know it inside out and backwards. They're accustomed to applying it. So I am more than happy to say, please, interpret some of that policy for me. Um, and as I say, I, I used to know who were my go-to people. I don't know if your agency attorneys are aware of the changes that will come about with NCFAS goes online and this new concept of the universal worker. But over time, there may be some loss of the kind of people we turned to in the past who were you know, deeply knowledgeable specialists on a particular area of income maintenance. Um, if your attorney's not aware of that, you might want to warn them that this is coming. Uh, at any time there's a major policy shift at the agency, make sure your agency the attorney knows about it because it can have a profound effect on, on the way they're able to do their job. Uh, ten, number 10 on the list that I was given was a series of question marks. I figured, OK, this is the final mystery category. I'll just fill it in as nobody stops trying till it works. I've been doing this for DSS for almost 18 years. I don't do anything now the way I did it when I started. And part of that is my own thought processes, adjusting the changes in the law. But a lot of it is coming from the social workers and the supervisors telling me, I think we could do this better if we tried it this way. I hope everybody keeps their minds open and everybody keeps trying till we find the most efficient way to get into court and secure safety and permanence for children. OK. Great. Thank you, Alice. That was, we, we had to give Alice a little less time than we thought. And she got through that really quickly. <laughs> that was so much information. I'm sorry about some of the errors with the slides. We sometimes have issues when we pull up our PowerPoints. It looks different in this room than it does on a, uh, just in PowerPoint. But um, just to remind you, you do have all of the slides and all of the great points and information that Alice made in your handouts starting on page 20 so that you can share them with others and have those for future reference. Um, thank you so much, Alice. I'm just looking. I don't see any um, pending questions. I think we've addressed everybody's questions. Again, feel free if you have any um, thoughts or responses to some of the points that Alice made. Um, but meanwhile, we do want to go into some case examples. Um, and so we just sort of were talking among the five of us about what are some of the sort of typical difficult situations that come up. One of them is certainly what to do when you're trying to figure out if a child should testify. So I want to open this up to all of you in the audience so you can learn from each other. And I'm also going to turn to my panelists. The first question is who should be involved in the decision about whether or not a child should testify. So if you would just use your chat box in your agency, who do you all consult with 
um, in, in making that decision. I'm going to just give you a couple of minutes to start answering and then I'll turn to my panel. Okay, this is great. Thank you. So it looks like a lot of folks are um, giving great examples. I'm going to just say, um, Angie, do you want to comment? Okay, I started talking without my mic on. Um, the I see some really great examples that are coming in the chat box. Um, I think you're covering all of them that I had on my list. But yes, you know, it's not just the social worker. You're going to involve your supervisor. You're going to involve the attorney. You're going to involve a therapist if the child has a therapist. And the GAL, that's great. You, the GAL probably will want to weigh in on that decision as well if there is a GAL. Um, actually, there probably will be a GAL if you're in court. Um, so definitely all of those people would want to weigh in. And, and yeah, exactly. The child may want to weigh in as well, depending on the child's age. Um, there are times when you need, even though nobody wants the child to testify because it's traumatic for that child, that's the only way to get the evidence in. Um, and so involving all those people, sometimes it's about the decision to testify, but sometimes it's also about what um, needs to be considered and to make that a little bit safer for the child to testify and not as traumatic. Thank you, Angie. And that you've already provided one answer to the second question, which is what issues do you need to consider? So one is obviously, is there information that only the child can provide through testimony? Um, so again, let me put this out to the audience and to the panel. What, what are other issues that you consider when making that decision? And I'm looking at my panel to see if anybody would like to um, uh, talk about that. Uh, well, and, and I was going to say, too, uh, one of the issues that I think we need to consider is um, the, the preparation for the child. If they are going to have to testify, um, all of those things that we talked about with the social worker, we need to consider. Can we get them in the courtroom um, beforehand so that they can sit in the chair, they know where everybody's going to be, know where their parents are going to be, know where a person that they trust is going to be if that's not their parents, um, uh, and, and understand what they're going to be asked and as much preparation as we can get for the kids I think is important again to um, give them a feeling of control. Thank you and I see some great comments about the age of child, the relationship between the child and the parent, that's a, that's a good point. And of course the lasting impact on the child to have to talk about that in front of um, so many people. I'm just looking at Alice or Angie if you would like to add anything in terms of issues to consider. Well one thing to consider is, um, is there another way to get statements from the child before the court? Um, and then that goes into, has the child made statements to other people about these core events? Um, under what circumstances did they make these statements? Can we use one of the hearsay exceptions so that grandma or the therapist or the doctor could testify and spare the child from having to testify? And this is a fairly complex analysis, but if you're hearing from, say, the child's therapist, that she's going to be just absolutely torn out of frame if she has to get on the stand, no matter what you do to protect her, no matter whether you set up the closed circuit TV cameras or get the perpetrator out of the room, if you're hearing that that could really, really be bad for the child, then we need to sit down and look at all the child's statements that were made to others and, and we'll analyze it on whether or not we could get it in under a hearsay exception and try that first. And, and try to spare the child from that. So um, you need to, when you're talking to people to whom the child has disclosed one of these core events, it's important to hear how the child disclosed it and in what circumstances the child disclosed it, as well as what the child disclosed. So that's something that investigators should always have in the back of their minds is if another adult is telling me what the child told them, I need to get the whole picture. I need to get that context. That may be an avenue for getting in the child's statement as hearsay as opposed to putting the child on the stand. 
That's great, thank you, and lots of great examples. We will, I just want to mention, we will send out a follow-up document, which we usually do um, after, um, uh, after this event, and so we will be sure to capture some of the other um, ideas and concepts that y'all are um, providing. Um, and I think in particular that whole idea of the child's emotional stability, emotional help and uh, health and, and ability to testify. Um, let's move on to another scenario that I think certainly adds to people's anxiety, whether it happens or whether they're just anticipating that it will happen. You are sitting on the stand and you just forget the details of, of what happened. So let me um, ask all of you, what have you done? What would you do? Your mind goes blank. You don't, you don't know the answer. Um, let me look to our panel, too, while our audience is considering that. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, Angie. Yeah. Sure, and a lot of it really goes back to preparation. So I'm going to take you back a step from what you do before you get on the witness stand. Um, there are some things you can do. One thing you can do is uh, make notes and have on that, like on index cards, and or, or whatever you want to use, but index cards work fine. Um, and just have your key dates and some of the key details. It's not going to make sense to anyone else, but it's going to help you remember those important um, details. Another thing, take your time, breathe. Don't forget to breathe. If you have to do relaxation exercises, that might actually help. Um, and then, you know, visit the courtroom ahead of time, like we've talked, we've said that a few times. But I think all of those things can really help. And I also like the idea of um, uh, some folks are saying the, you can ask the attorney to rephrase, ask for clarification. So sometimes it's just about giving yourself other ways to give yourself a few minutes um, to kind of gather your thoughts. And here's a question from Michelle uh, McCoy. Is it OK to say, I don't recall? Absolutely. Uh, that, that is, if that's the most honest response, that's what you give. I do not remember. And my response to that would be, is there any way in which you can refresh your memory? And then you say, well, I could look at my dictation of that conversation. And then the court will permit you to do that. And you can actually read you know, into the record. You'd, you'd have to establish, these are my notes, which I made on the date that I spoke to John Smith about the allegations. And this is a specific thing that I could not recall that I have written here. So yeah. You'd, I, there's no reason to go into court and, and try to pretend like we remember everything. Nobody remembers everything. And the older we get, the less we remember. So you know, the court understands that. And they would much rather you say honestly, I don't remember, but I can look at my notes and recall it from that, than to fudge it or use words like I think or I guess. We don't want to hear I think and I guess. If you don't remember, tell us you don't remember, and we'll refresh your memory in some fashion. Um, if there is no means of refreshing your memory, well, that's that's life. Um, you know, <laughs> not everybody remembers everything, so you shouldn't be upset that you don't. Okay, okay great, thank you, and great advice. And again, we'll capture those in the follow-up document. Um, let me go on to the next one, which I think also is a source of a lot of anxiety. You all mentioned sometimes getting asked hostile questions by the parent's attorney. So let me just put it out to the audience. What are the hard questions that you've been asked or that you've heard a social worker ask when you've been in court? Or what are the hard questions that you're worried about being asked? So let me just give a, a few minutes for folks to share some of those examples. Yeah. Okay, great examples, and let me, I'm just going to turn to my panel, too. Uh, what have you done to help the family? Um, are you a social worker or a cheerleader? <laughs> um, when there are multiple questions in one statement from the attorney trying to confuse you, um, or asking sort of confusing questions, and Angie, I know you talked a little bit about 
um, some of some some of the tactics that are intentionally used. I don't know what um, in terms of what you would say how to respond to some of those intentionally confusing or more sort of aggressive questions. Sorry, what do you want to do? You want to talk a little bit about that, based on some of these examples, how you might respond. For example, the the confusing question, intentionally confusing questions, if you're just not able to understand. Sure. Um, the I actually have a, a nice quote from that article that I referenced earlier at the link on page 19, um, where Perry and Welsh say, "You will." often feel attacked during cross-examination, but if you become defensive, you leave a bad impression with the judge. If you stay reasonable and respectful, testifying within your area of comfort, the, those opinions and facts you are sure of, you can often turn the tables on the examining attorney. Sometimes the calmer you become, the more anxious they become. When an attorney badgers or treats you with disrespect, especially if you do not reciprocate, they leave a bad impression with the judge. So um, I just think that, again, it's because just stay um, detached from what's going on. Don't take it personally, and try to answer your question in a professional, calm manner. Thank you. And I also saw some that you all had talked about, and Holly, I think you talked about this. Some of those personal questions, like, "What is your degree? Do you have children?" Really, sort of getting at your own personal credibility. Do you want to say a little bit about that of responding to those types? Yeah, I think those are some of the ones, and I think we have to remember the role of the parent attorney is to make the star witness for, this, for the division's case look bad. And since you are often the star witness, we just need to be prepared that they may ask some of those things. And again, answer them matter-of-factly, calmly, professionally. If you don't have children, you don't have children. It has no bearing on the case. They're going to try to make a big deal out of it, but if you stay professional, the judge is going to see that. Um, the judge is aware that it has no bearing on the case. Um, if you are young, or even if you just look young, and they're asking, you know, how long have you been doing this? If you have only been doing it six months, you've only been doing it six months. So just to be prepared for it and be able to say that with conviction and um, move on. Uh, again, just going back to what Angie said, keeping um, an attitude out of your voice, making sure that you're just looking them in the eye and answering them in a calm, professional way, um, and slowing down the pace. Sometimes when they get on a roll with some of those questions, they'll try to speed up the pace. Even if you know the answer, it's OK to take a minute and just breathe and slow down the pace a little bit and answer the question um, sort of at your pace uh, and to let them, to let yourself kind of catch up. That's great, thank you. And I know several people talked about uh, talked about those types of questions. They seem like great questions too. That might be helpful for a practice session ahead of time because I think it's e you know sometimes we say to be professional, be calm. But what to, what would I actually say? What words would I use, and how would I say it? Those some of those really predictable questions maybe. Go ahead. Uh, there's a comment in the chat, chat room about non-DSS attorneys have no true conception or idea how DSS works and what our policies are. And that is something that comes up a lot. They will, sometimes they do it deliberately. They will overstate our power or they will um, use inflammatory words to describe our processes that we engage in. And you have to find that professional teaching voice to say, no, sir, DSS did not order Mr. Johnson to leave the home. Mr. DSS doesn't have the power to do that. Only the court does. We entered into a safety plan with Mrs. Johnson where she agreed that he would remain out of the home while we conducted our investigation. So you do have to explain a lot. And don't get that exasperated, oh, Christ, how stupid can this person be note in your voice when you're doing it. Because the judge probably knows some of it already. It doesn't hurt to remind him, but you have to use a very professional voice when you do that and explain things so that it's really clear exactly what we were doing and that it was in accordance with policy. 
Thank you. I know a few people also mentioned being cut off, so you're trying to respond, and the attorney is cutting you off with additional, few more questions. Um, what would you say about that? Well, it depends. If he started out by asking you a yes or no question, which is something he's permitted to do on cross-examination, and you start by saying, you know, yes or no doesn't really fit exactly, so you say yes, but, or something, and it indicates that you want to try to explain it, he's going to cut you off. Um, you, sometimes it works if you turn to the judge and say, may I explain my answer? Some judges don't like that. They'll, they'll just shut you down and say, no, just answer what he asked you. And um, also, if he does it repeatedly, if it's somebody who's trying to break up your rhythm or frustrate you by doing this over and over again and cutting you off, then you know your attorney can make an objection. Your Honor, you know, allow her to finish your answer, please. Uh, you know, so there's there's ways to help you with that stuff. Um, I like Andrea Duncan's yeah. suggestion. Just ask nicely if you may finish. Yes, your answer. may I finish? That idea of maintaining your making the other attorney look bad. Because even if the judge doesn't let you do it right then, you've alerted your attorney that on rebuttal or you know redirect they need to flesh out that answer fully to give the whole picture to the judge. Yeah. Great. And one, I'm going to go on to the next question because thank you all for the examples and the suggestions. Um, really, really helpful, really good ideas. Someone actually brought this up, the, the idea of whether, um, asking about whether the social worker's opinion um, is different from your agency's case decision. Um, and so, what would you do, um, say, and Holly, I'm guessing that may have happened to you as a DSS social worker, what do you do when your agency has made a case decision and, um, and you actually decide? So that shouldn't, is not something that needs to be discussed in the courtroom. Um, those are things that happen at our agency in the staffing. Once the agency's decision is made, the social worker needs to be able to get on board with that and say this is the agency's decision. If they're asked if it differs from their personal opinion, I think the, the, an appropriate way to answer is just that, this, that I don't have a personal opinion in this case. My opinion is that of the agencies, and this isn't about personal, this is a professional opinion, and um, my opinion is that of the agencies. Um, and, and you need to be aware of that. I think supervisors, attorneys, social workers all need to be on the lookout. If you see that there's something where the social worker is not feeling great, you need to have that discussion beforehand and get everybody on the same page because, again, that goes back to that whole accumulating credibility that Alice has talked about. That's great, thank you. And I know lots of people had some good examples of simply restating the agency's decision. We don't make decisions independently. So great, great examples. Um, I have a question. What if DSS has a different recommendation than the GAL? Certainly, I don't think an uncommon situation. Um, what to, anything to suggest, Angie, in that? I, I think it's probably, um, it shouldn't be that uncommon that you do have some differences between the D GAL and the DSS recommendation because you have different roles in the courtroom. Um, the GAL is, rec is looking at specifically at what's in that child's best interest, and DSS has a lot more things that they have to factor into that. So, um, I, I, you know, again, just be professional and um, acknowledge that you have, you know, you've you're looking at things holistically and that when I say you, I mean your agency is looking at things holistically and that this is the agency's recommendation. Thank you. And we just have one more I'm just going to bring up quickly before we get to our um, closing. And that's um, similar but a little bit of a different feel where you, you, you know, we've talked a lot about preparing and being ready to say what you did and why you did it. Sometimes there have been people involved in the case who may not have done what was supposed to be done or may not have done what you would have done. And so what, what do you say about sort of when you are representing a full case history and some of it is, is not work you're necessarily feeling good about?
I guess. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, this is Holly. Um, this does happen sometimes. Sometimes it's because maybe the work done before really wasn't good. Other times it's just a difference of style or things like that. Um, those are things that, again, need to be discussed with your supervisor and your attorney beforehand to talk about how are we going to address these things. Alice talked a little bit about sometimes she might ask somebody to admit to a mistake or um, admit to maybe something that should have happened that didn't or didn't happen as smoothly as we could have. Um, so I think, again, just preparation is important. If you've got something that wasn't done well in the past, how are we going to address that and to practice that beforehand? We can't go back and change it. So um, if, if you're the social worker and you're reading through this history and you see something, really important to bring it to your supervisor's attention and the attorney's attention so that you can talk about how you're going to address it. Um, it may be that the supervisor, um, if they were th present when that work was done, might be able to put it in context and make you feel a little bit better about it. Um, but you may just need to figure out how you're going to deal with it because you might be stuck with it. No, anything else anybody wants to add? Go ahead, Al. Um, you know, I think one of the things you can look at, if, if this is something that's likely to come out in court or be dealt with in court, is, you know, how much of the past work is really relevant to what's going on today. I mean, a, a lot of times social workers like to lay out the entire history of the case or the entire history of their interactions with a family. But if we're at a review hearing and you've been on the case for several months now, you know, some of that history can be kind of rendered down or reduced. So it may not even be something that someone would be, become alert to and discuss. Again, if, if you're working the case right now, that's the main thing that you need to be talking about. Um, and, and, and I also think that Holly's right. What's in the record may not be everything. I mean, we hope that everything that's happened has been documented, but we know that sometimes things don't, especially when workers leave abruptly for greener pastures or what have you. So the supervisor's memory may be able to fill in some of those gaps, may make you feel better about what was done before. Okay. Thank you, Alice. Thank you all. So I'm just looking. I don't think there are any outstanding questions. Um, I do want to just ask a general question in terms of sort of transferring the knowledge from this to your own work. Because we have such a varied audience, uh, my question for everyone is, what is one thing that your agency, either the agency you work for or represent as an attorney, what is one thing that you think your agency could do to improve the partnership between the social workers and its attorneys and, and, and in turn, improve the outcome on your um, hearings? I'm just going to give you all a few minutes to type um, what one thing your agency, you would like your agency to do to improve that partnership. Okay, so thank you. So I'm seeing more joint staffings um, and meetings with the attorneys. That's great. Um, and just getting that time, that preparation time, that staffing time. I know that's that's one of the challenges um, is really figuring out how do we schedule that time and um, knowing that it makes such a big difference um, and getting those things on the calendar. So great. Okay. Well, while you continue to do that, um, uh, those examples, and again, we'll share those some of those in the follow-up document. I just want to remind you, you also have our presenters' um, contact information, and they have graciously agreed to not only share their contact information if you have other questions, but also to help us with that follow-up document. 